Welcome to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. This is a live broadcast. I'm Tim Gritty, and I'm here with Lou Weiss, who is the founder of Manufacturing Talk Radio, also the president of All Metals at the Forge Group, a company that manufactures open dive forgings and seamless roll rings for heavy industry. So if you have that need, go to steelforge.com. And joining us, as always, at the first business day of the month is Tim Fiore, who is the committee chair for the ISM report on business for the manufacturing sector. Tim, thanks for joining us. I think Tim's on mute for the moment. Well, good to be here, guys. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Oh, it's good to have you on, Tim. I'm not going to uh, um, take it away into your thunder. You've got some great slides to go through. I think those are really important for our viewers to see, and uh, Tim will talk through them so that the listeners who are getting just the audio portion will understand what he's speaking of. Okay, great, thanks. So, oh, go ahead, Tim. Luke. Just one point before you start, uh, uh, I'd like to announce that today is eight years since the idea of manufacturing talk radio was uh, evolved. And in two weeks from now, it'll be eight years that we're actually broadcasting. So that being said, take it away, Tim. Uh, congratulations. Eight years flies right by, doesn't it? I bet it does. Yeah, you guys provide a lot of good value to the manufacturing communities, for sure. We appreciate all your support. Uh, thank you. Okay, so the month of October, uh, we exceeded expectations from the economist standpoint um, by probably about a half a point to a point. And we pretty much came in equal to September, you know, three tenths of a point off. So pretty much at the headline number level, pretty much equivalent to September. But dig into the detail. And, and of course, as usual, it tells the real story. So we, you know, the five sub indexes shifted around a bit. And probably the most significant one here is that the new order level came off almost seven points, which normally would be a little bit alarming. But in today's you know, crazy manufacturing world, sprinkled in with a whole bunch of COVID stuff, uh, it could be explained. Uh, you know, on top of uh, uh, the fact that we had a new order number that was down, the suppliers for the second month now have, again, struggled worse than they did uh, in August. We had three or so months uh, culminating in August where things were getting better for them. And then in September that reversed and in October it's it's accelerating. So, so the supplier problems are back at it and you know, in, in my experience with this stuff is you get to a level and then you come off it and you come off slow and you continue off it until there's an event. You don't do a, a you don't do an up and down, up and down. And that's that's where we are now with supplier deliveries. And then if you match that up with the prices number, prices is doing the same thing. We saw a relaxation uh, all the way through till August and a reversal in September. Prices increased faster than they did in August. And now in the month of October, same thing again. So uh, what's happening? And then you look at our lead times. Our raw material lead times are still at record levels. They've been record levels for about six months now. And it really extended out. They're probably 2x what they had been uh, last summer or you know, probably pre-pandemic 2019. Capital lead times, again, uh, three or four days added on the month of October. And even MRO has extended out. So I, I think what's really happening here is you got a pause going on with the buying community. Uh, they've got you know record high prices, they've got record long lead times, and they might and they probably have order positions placed in all the way through Q1, maybe part of Q2. Uh, the question now is, as they cement their business plans for 2022, and they have their standard costs set, they know what that's going to be for 2022. They have a price variance budget that's been set for 2022. So now it's game on to beat the budget. And the first thing you do is you, you know you're not going to jump in. With, uh, with both feet and pay the highest prices you've ever seen. You're probably gonna stall a little bit. And that's probably what's happening here is a little bit of a stall because they've got orders out there much longer than they normally do. Uh, that steel has not been able to break the $2,000 a ton level. It's now down below 1900. Plastics are easing a bit, but they're gonna run into the headwind of high uh, uh, natural gas prices. And it's probably a wait now. It's probably a wait maybe into early to mid December, maybe all the way through December. I think they feel pretty comfortable that their order positions out there are going to cover them uh, at the highest prices probably they've paid in a long time. So, you know, really good, really good report here. Uh, another interesting piece: uh, manufacturing inventory. 
38 year high on manufacturing inventory. Never, I mean, since I've been doing this report for four years, the, the, the manufacturing inventory, which I used to call raw material inventory, the, the manufacturing inventory is plus or minus two points. It's 48 to 52. And never does it really vary that much. We're at 57 now and continuing to climb. And, and the, the primary reason is work in process inventory continues to grow because of part shortages. People are taking whatever raw material they can get because it's better to have it than to have to chase it. And in some cases, some industries are holding more finished goods inventory because clients like the automotive guys won't let them ship until they open the factories. So, uh, so you know, a lot of stuff going on in the report. Let's 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 talk. Uh, one of the points that uh, I'd like to uh, present to the, uh, our listeners is that um, the steel prices that have not reached two thousand dollars a ton. We have to remember that that's two thousand a ton from when it was four or five hundred a ton about eighteen months ago. So the prices of steel have skyrocketed and it's holding up there at that skyrocket price uh, to a great extent because of shortages and logistics and not being able to ship and you know all the rest of the items that uh, interfere with our uh, uh, our. Uh, flow of uh, merchandise and uh, products. Yes, indeed. It's, uh, it's quite a time, quite a dynamic time. But I think I may have mentioned this, that fundamentally, it's a labor problem. It continues to be a labor problem. It's now becoming very clear that the labor, there's no magic wand on this labor thing. This is going to be slow, slow going. And primarily, you know, we had the kids go back to school. And there's obviously been shutdowns, but generally not. Uh, we eliminated all the enhanced unemployment and some of that's still dribbling off, but generally that's gone. It's replaced by the fact that people are chasing wages. We had 32% of my employment comments were attrition and retirement related, 32%. 27% of those is attrition. So you know, today you're trying to hire two people to expand your headcount. By the end of the week, you hire the two. Well, in the meantime, you got two people uh, quitting to go to the job down the street. So you're back in it again. And, and you know, we've been talking about it now for a couple months. Uh, the month of October, we had 5% uh, of the employment comments talked about turnover. Uh, no, 5% talked about it was getting better than September. In September, 3% said it was getting better than August. In August, nobody said it was getting better. So, but you just look at those three numbers, zero, three, five, it's gonna be slow. It's going to be slow, and and I'm not sure how long it's going to take. But it, it is a labor issue. It's a labor issue uh, all the way from the mine to the person who gets the stuff, puts it on the shelf, and sells it to you, all the way through the supply chain. And in the month of October, again, transportation was even worse than it was in, in September. So we haven't peaked on the transportation side. And like I've been saying now for months, is I think. That's going to be the first indicator of things starting to get to a normal level is if transportation eases. Well, it's not easing. And in my supplier delivery section, I think 40, 43% of my comments were transportation related in the month of September was more like 38. So it's continues to get worse. Well, it's, uh, it's getting worse. And uh, there are organizations out there. And, uh, one in particular is uh, Reshoring Institute. Uh, their main function is to bring jobs back to America. Well, you're bringing more jobs back to America where we don't have employees. And, you know, it, one, one is a good thing, but you can't solve it because we're already a million short in the work pool in manufacturing. And it's now claimed that uh, by 2023, I think it is, or 23 and a half, that there is going, that number, if nothing else happens, if can we continue the way we're going, we're gonna be at three and a half or 4 million short. So bring back those jobs to America, folks. You still won't have any product. Well, we'll have to do something on the immigration side. I mean, that's always been a solution. You can't do anything on the birth rate side. That's pretty much a long-term play. That's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> and somehow you're gonna entice people to leave the office and get out there and do some, physical work. I'm not going to say real work, physical work. Right. But, you know, a number of elements of play here. But yeah, it's, uh, 
you hear you hear more and more about reshoring. I, I think it was not really talked about for you know a couple of years there, even when all the tariffs were put in place. Now now we have the tariffs coming off for Europe, European steel and aluminum, although it wasn't a big piece of our steel consumption anyway, but I think it's a good sign that, that they're getting to something that makes a, a little bit more sense. But uh, yeah, you see more and more of it, not only because of supply chain risk, but you got financial risk and you got longer term risk here with geopolitical issues in, in, uh, in, in Asia. You, you know those aren't going away. When you have two successive administrations play the same uh, football game, then obviously it is a serious issue that is not gonna get resolved by somebody's different attitude. It's a, it's a fundamental issue that is gonna take a long time to fix. And part of that may mean reshoring. I am hearing uh, through, through several different channels that USMCA issues are now becoming much more prevalent which is requiring more and more content in the, in the US and Mexico versus importing from, from castings to transmission you know, assembly and machining and all kinds of stuff. So a lot of, a lot of stuff on our foraging plants. There you go, Lou, an opportunity to expand your business. Yeah, looking at it now. <laughs> Tim, I'm curious about the rather dramatic change in new orders month to month. Uh, is there a particular reason that your respondents shared with you why those new orders were uh, you know, seven points softer than they were the month before? Yeah, well, yeah, so, I, you know, it's really the, the fact that people are waiting here. They're waiting on the pricing issue, I think, and the pricing and lead time, and, and they're waiting for the year to end. So I don't think we're going to get back into... A, a normal groove here, whatever normal is post pandemic until probably January. But so here's our table at a glance. And uh, let me see if I can pull up the pointer for those uh, listeners who are actually watching. Yes, I can. All right, good. So here's our 10 sub indexes over here on the left hand side and our headline index is across the top. This is a great chart because uh, you, know, you, you get your hands on a report once a month, take a look at this because it shows you what's happening on the index and sub-index side for the, the, the prior month, you know, last month, the, the month before that, the prior month, in this case, September, it shows you the percent point change month to month, like in the case of the PMI, we're down 0.3 points compared to September. It shows you whether it's a, above 50 or below. So in this case, we're growing, which means we're above 50. The rate of change is the rate of change month to month. So it's saying slower, but obviously it's marginally slower. It only slowed by three tenths of a point. And it shows you the amount of months that you've been over 50. So it's a really good report. Uh, it, you, know, you need to, like I said, we just had a, a month, uh, October to September that was very similar to, uh, they were very equal. But if you look at these numbers, you can see the pluses and minuses, you know, they're not really so equal. So you guys know that what, what I like to do is I like to look at the uh, demand consumption and input sides. And, and this is what I'm showing you on this slide. So. Demand is in uh, fuchsia, I guess that is. Uh, consumption is blue and inputs is green. And primarily I think the consumption piece is a result of, but in this particular post pandemic cycle here, that employment level uh, is, is really weighing a lot into the production output. But to answer your question, Tim, the new orders are down 6.9, but look at customer inventories, 31.7, you know, flat and very low uh, and about 14 months below 40 and uh you know the the about right customer inventory number is probably somewhere around 47 so we're sitting at 31 so you got a bunch of empty shelves there backlog of order 63.6 we're off 1.2 but this is near records i mean i think the record was 66 or something set back three or four months ago but we've, we've never really run it at this kind of 60s level for this long so that's very encouraging that even when demand does slump into the mid fifties or low fifties. We got lots of work here between backlog that has to be worked on and filling of customer shelves that has to occur. And then, you know, the positive thing on the demand side, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we had a, a plus 1.2 step up here in new export orders. Those aren't shipments, those are orders. But that's really good because the export market has been pretty sluggish for most of this uh, uh, post pandemic climb out. And Europe is now opening up Europe had a, uh, a good Q3, good Q2, I think it is. Uh, it was equal to our Q1. So they're probably about a quarter behind us. 
but uh, they're starting to climb out now, and uh, and and there's some demand showing up there. So overall, demand's doing pretty good. I'm, I can't really complain about it. Got to watch this new order number because I believe the new order number stepped down because of extended lead times and high prices, and it caused buyers to not continue to feed the supply chain with additional orders beyond what they think is a reasonable lead time. So we have a little bit of an adjustment there. Then, you know, go to the uh, input side, because this has been the story now post pandemic. So imports actually contracted. We're, we're at the peak now of the uh, of the port issues. They're, they're, they're peaking, but I don't think they're going to subside really probably until April. Uh, so, you know, we're actually contracting here compared to the prior month. That, that just says everything is just jammed up, jammed up. Supplier deliveries, like I mentioned, up 2.2 points. This is the second month of an increase in supplier delivery number, which means it's slowing and it's slowing faster, which is not really good at, at this point in the cycle. Uh, inventory numbers here, plus 1.4. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier on, a uh, function of uh, raw material, work in process, as well as finished goods, and 38 year record here at 57. And then the prices number here, very consistent with what's happening in the supplier deliveries, the second straight month of increasing prices yet again. <clears throat> following four or five months of uh, slowing, slowing price increases. So, so this is kind of the story. And then right in the center here, this production number ought to be at 65, 66. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. The demand is there. The uh, inventory is, uh, is there. Uh, you know, the problem is that there isn't enough labor. And, you know, a 1.8 point step up from the prior month is pretty weak. This employment number, given the demand and the backlog, ought to be in the mid 60s and it's not. So, uh, and, and it goes back to, well, why is that? And, you know, not only, like I mentioned earlier on, we have a situation now where kids are back in school, enhanced unemployment's gone, but it's been replaced by a wage chasing. And, uh, and that's a spiral that not really clear when that's gonna, gonna stop. So that was, so with that, you guys have any questions on this thing? On the, uh, the employment side, uh, I heard from the U.S. Census Bureau that I think it was last month or the month before they had the highest number of people quitting. And it seems as though that they are taking this period of time, the COVID period of time, to uh, perhaps follow their passion, perhaps open a business. Uh, the number of businesses that have opened up in the last year also have hit uh, record numbers. So people are quitting or they're not wanting to drive trucks or they're not wanting to deliver mail or whatever it is. They're finding other things and other passions to do. And I, I think that, that doesn't show up uh, clearly, but it certainly shows an end result of the numbers that you're showing. Yeah, I think it's a combination of a bunch of stuff, Lou. When you quit, <clears throat> you have to quit to take another job. Right. So if, right. You're, chasing the, if you're chasing a buck, you gotta quit. And yeah, people are definitely exiting the workforce to try to find a different uh, quality of life. Uh, you know, I don't think this forced vaccination thing is going to really help all that. You know, the people are really going to stick to their guns here, and they're going to try to try to have it work out the way they want it to. And forcing people to get vaccinated is going to be a difficult thing. We're I think we're just now in the beginnings of it, and it's not going to help the manufacturing economy or the services economy if you're firing people because they won't take a vaccine, you know, so, you know, we won't get into that, but yeah, it's all around that attrition stuff that you're talking about. And, uh, and it's a changing environment. There's a lot of rules here, a lot of rules that we used to, to consider to be rules that are not rules anymore. And right. you, know, you get a different generation now in the workforce and than what we were used to. And, and they, they, they feel that they have more choices and, you know, they probably do. So, uh, yeah. Uh, there, there was a gal out on the West Coast that uh, she was working in some kind of civil service position and she wound up quitting about a year ago and she started an online uh, company and her first year of sales was $400,000 and uh, she's won some kind of uh, award for being the best or whatever during this uh, time period. Uh, and I, I heard her interviewed and she was terrific. She said, if I only would have known, I would have done it sooner. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Tim, I want to talk about this 
whole uh, inventory, warehouse, containers in the yard, ships on the water. And I agree with you, by the way, that it won't be resolved anytime soon. I think April is even optimistic. Uh, in looking at the LA port situation where 40% of our imports come from, they're maxed out. I understand they just opened 67 acres of land wherever they found that in, in the LA basin to start putting other containers or shipping containers empty back to China. Um, I guess my sense of it may be similar to yours. This is gonna be a long-term problem that could stretch the entire year of 2022. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, we're, we're at 16, 17 months into expansion and, and generally our expansions go 35, 36 months. So you know, we're coming up on the halfway point and, and that's a 50 to 50 kind of number. So, and we're still sitting here at 60. So uh, we got a ways to go, no doubt about it. I mean, I, you can see on the right-hand side of this chart, I, there's certain things that I track based on the comments that I think are relevant. So we're still in that demand driven supplier constrained environment. Just because the new order number came off, I don't think that's changed anything. Uh, we'd have to see that new order number get down to the 55, 54 level before I would change my opinion on what's really driving everything here. We had four and a half positive comments to not so positive comments up from three to one in September. So uh, even with the exasperation and exhaustion of the supply management community, they're still positive about the future from a demand standpoint. <clears throat> that's really what I look for. Are they, are they forecasting the future to be good or are they concerned about it or whatever? And four to five is a pretty good number uh, because most of the comments, 90% of the comments are supply chain related, chasing this, facing this high price. And, and now they're, you know, the community is now engrossed in that. They're not so much talking about how's business overall, their use of business being good. And they're, they're, and so they're spending a lot of time telling me about they can't get this, they can't get that, transportation issues. I think I mentioned 43, 44% of my uh, supplier delivery comments were transportation issues, like almost every other one. <clears throat> can't get this, can't get that. And in the general comment section, it was higher too. I think it was 32 or something like that versus 20, 26. So transportation continues, uh, the, the feeling is positive. On the employment side, uh, 22 to one hire to force manage, 22 to one. So for every for every company that was looking to hire freeze, a trip to a headcount level or layoff, there's 22 companies who are looking to hire. And uh, the, the one the one comment that came out of that was 32% of those uh, of, of that 80 90 percent were still commenting about um, difficulties in hiring. Uh, which is different. It, it actually relaxed from the from the September number. So it seems like they felt it was easier to hire in the month of October compared to September. And then, you know, thirty two percent of the total comments here were attrition and retirement related, which is you know really really concerning. One of one of the major problems, and we only uh, skidded over that a few moments ago, and that's the uh, issue with regards to uh, containers in China. Uh, the containers that are coming from China are not going back to China because they're going back empty. So a year and a half ago, a container was, a 40 foot container was about $4,000. And today it's 19 or $20,000 and nothing is going back to China because we're not exporting to them like we normally were. So this, this is a big problem. My feeling about it, and for whatever my opinion is worth, I don't know why they don't ship back the empties, even if it does cost $20,000, because it's five times more than they were making before. So if they were able to ship them back, ship back empties, they could load it up again and ship it back to the States for their $20,000 number, which is five times greater than what they were getting a year and a half ago. So to me, my oversimplification it sounds ridiculous that they're not shipping the containers back. Well, I, I think there's, well, I, they are because eventually they all the containers would be here and then you wouldn't have any port blockage. So they're, they're shipping containers back. And well, then I think you mentioned about the warehouses. Well, the, the problem with the warehouses is that 
they're getting the containers at the port. They want to decant that container right away so they can put it back on the boat and ship it back. And that's why there's such a demand on the warehousing in the Long Beach, the Inland Empire. I mean, you can't find a, I mean, they're probably out in the cow pastures out in Nevada now. They're, they they got to get the stuff out of the box so they can turn the box around and send it back. They don't want that box going all the way to uh, Chicago or to St. Louis because it's valuable on the ship going back. And just, you know, you're, you're right to a large extent. And you're, you're talking about massive ships, 20,000 containers on them. Right. They unload them in two days. Well, and they have to get 22,000 containers back on them. So it's, it's quite a, it's quite an activity. And, you know, the, the good thing is, I think we mentioned last month is that they've widened the Suez Canal and not Suez, I'm sorry, the Panama Canal. So why isn't that having an impact? Well, it is a little bit, but not to the extent that it probably should have. The sailing time still through the canal up the coast to Savannah and Charleston and Houston is still much longer than waiting in a queue uh, at the port seven to 10 days to get your ship unloaded. So, but I, I did hear something in, I think it's Savannah. Savannah is pretty backed up too. They have, a, they have ships offshore waiting for unloading too. And, <clears throat> they've got the deep harbor now like you, you need for those big big super ships that go through the Panama Canal now. I, I didn't hear the latest number, but the last number that I recall of the ships off of uh, Long Beach was 80. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of, it's 80 times 20,000. That's a lot of containers. Yeah, 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 no, it, yeah, it is, it is. And I, I think we're at the peak, but I think we'll stay relatively at this peak until most likely somewhere May. I mean, I don't think we're going to make any progress on this until the Lunar New Year, which is February. Right, right. Because, and, and actually, you're talking about three or four weeks after the Lunar New Year, because that's when everything will dry up. The inbound will dry up. So it's probably mid-March, you know, before we start to see some relief on it. And then we could have bad weather. So why don't we make it April? Well, it could be. <laughs> Could be. That, that was the month that Tim mentioned, so that probably that's looks right. good. That's right. Uh, and Tim, I just saw where the GDP for the third quarter, their first estimate is 2.0, so 2% GDP growth. They expect it to rally in the fourth quarter. What are your predictions for how it's going to roll out here? We're into November now, and at the end of the month, end of the year is uh, upon us soon. Uh, it looks to me like things are going to go very much the way they've been going. Is that your read of it? Well, you know, GDP is everything, manufacturing and services. So, uh, and, and you know, the manufacturing PMI tends to lead all. And, and we're doing great. So, you know, I think there was probably a, a dip on the services side in reality, uh, primarily around the Del Delta variant back in the summertime. And, and they're feeling some of that now in, in uh, Q3. But I, you know, I think... The 2% is not a big disappointment because if you average out the four quarters, it's still a very high level of activity for 2021. I mean, I think we're gonna still break records. I think they're talking about record breaking here. So uh, and, and 2022 is gonna be interesting. I mean, I, I think if we if we did three to 4%, that would be really good. That's a strong economy, remember? I mean, you guys remember 1.7. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, Tim, we appreciate you being with us. We know you've got lots of other folks to talk to. The Institute for Supply Management number for the Purchasing Managers Index is, is widely followed uh, around the world and certainly here in the U.S. It's a, it's a vital number to give us a, an indicator of what's happening. So we appreciate you being with us and taking the time to explain it in detail. Yeah, glad to help. I mean, just uh, for, for your listeners, the, the key here is still labor. And it's very clear now that it's going to take a long time for the labor market to get to where we need it to be for a lot of reasons. And, you know, some of those, I think Lou kind of talked about at the beginning here. And uh, as more jobs come back, more people are required. And do we have enough? But that's always what's made America great is that our labor force has been flexible and plentiful. And we'll figure out a way. No doubt. No doubt. And we want to thank everyone for watching this live episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. We hope you have also seen it where the link was provided from the Institute for Supply Management. And we appreciate all those who are surf over to jacketmediaco.com where you can see the other podcasts we produce. And as always, thank you for listening to Manufacturing Talk Radio. Thank okay, you. All. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.